event. So Xavier Harrington is speaking tonight on erasure within the margins then and off the page now. She is with the University of Southern Indiana, an accomplished educator and speaker, and we are delighted to welcome her to the Evansville Museum, so please join me. everyone. You'll have to forgive me. I'm an old millennial, so I take my laptop and my phone and my iPad everywhere I go. No physical papers for me. Um, I want to take a second, if you don't mind, please just um, uh, allow me to thank you for taking time out of what I'm sure are very busy schedules to hear anyone, let alone me, talk about issues of diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, I know you have several places you could have been tonight, but I do appreciate seeing your faces here tonight. Um, if you would, Please indulge me. Um, if you believe in the power of prayer, if you could send a prayer out for my friend um, and someone I consider to be my sister, Dr. Ashley Jordan. She traveled home a few days ago to be with her family um, during their time of bereavement. Um, she recently lost two very close family members. And on her way back, she found out that she had the flu. So if you, again, believe in the power of prayer, please send one up for her. And if prayer isn't your forte, that's fine. I'm sure she would love all positive vibes and well wishes, too. Um, this work is heavy. A lot of times we're talking about issues of diversity and inclusion to audience members who would rather be anywhere else. Um, but it's important when you're feeling ill that you know that there are people out there who are thinking about you and praying for you and wishing you well. So. Um, I wanted to say that uh, be, so that she knows that I'm grateful uh, for the opportunity. I'm grateful that she considered me a, a suitable stand-in. Uh, however, I do wish her well, and I'm excited to have her back here because if you believe it or not, I planned on being out in the audience with you tonight, not up here. So thank you for indulging me. Now, I'm aware that many of you came here wondering, how do you pronounce her name? <laughs> Who is she again? And does she even live here? I don't think I know her. Who is that? So for the sake of transparency and my positionality as a researcher, um, I'd like to share a little bit about myself before we jump in, if that's OK. OK. So I'm Professor Xavier Harrington. Uh, and I serve as a faculty member in the teacher education department at the University of Southern, Southern Indiana. Uh, after what felt like the longest few months spent waiting for word, the teacher education department told me that I was the prime candidate for this tenure track assistant professor uh, of education job, and it's been a whirlwind to say the least. Um, very seldomly uh, do you, as a PhD scholar, approach the end of your PhD journey and find that you're able to continue to teach on a campus that you love with students that you've developed relationships with and teach the things that you're really passionate about. So when I say that it's been a whirlwind, I mean that in the most positive way, it's a coveted position. Tenure track jobs don't come uh, a dime a dozen. But I'm happy to say that I'm able to stay here in Evansville with you all and teach our students out at USI and continue to build those relationships that I started seven years ago. Some of you are going seven years. I can't believe it. It's been seven years in August. So I would describe myself um, as someone who's passionate about students, who's passionate about diversity, who's passionate about issues of equity and inclusion. And my prayer is that something that I say tonight resonates and allows you to consider what more you can do to truly help others. So I present to you Erasure within the margins then and off the page now. Quote, you don't have to be anti-man to be pro-woman. Jane Galvin Lewis. When men are oppressed, it's a tragedy. When women are oppressed, it's tradition. Letty Cotton Pogreen. Men are taught to apologize for their weaknesses. Women, we're taught to apologize for our strengths. Lois Wise. If you ask any woman, and I do mean any woman, so how is life as a woman? How would you describe your daily life as a woman? Research tells us that the depth of the answers you would receive are dependent upon two things. Who you are as the inquirer, and truly their perception of your trustworthiness. Can you be trusted with my truth? Will you say that I'm embellishing or lying if I tell you what I really deal with? Will you tell me, but your life is so great, ellipses. 
When I share what I face, will you believe me or try to answer it or explain it away? What would these women mention and whom would they name as the culprit? Would the men be the classic villains in their Disney movies or maybe other women? Now, take those same issues and compound them with not just identity as a woman, but another dimension of diversity like race. How would a non-white woman answer the same questions? And I want to put a very pregnant pause there to give you a second to really think about that. How would a woman answer the question of what is life like as a woman? What's your daily existence as a woman? Try to think of those answers and then take a second, if you will, and indulge me and try to think of the same answers that you would receive from a non-white woman. What would she say? What would they say? And what would you say in response? Would she mention some instances of mental, emotional, or verbal abuse? Would she mention behaviors that seem to be unlike her? Would she mention feelings of inferiority? Would she mention overt sexualization at a young age? Would she mention the inability to create unique relationships with non-black friends? Would she mention a constant fear of being watched or judged? Would she mention too many unspoken rules that should govern how she moves every day? Well, statistically speaking, non-white women, also known as women of color, experience all of these emotions far too often. Some scholars even go as far as, as, far as to say that most women of color, in particular black girls and women, experience many of these emotions daily. Can you imagine? You're not just dealing with the pressures associated with womanhood, but you're also coping with the pressures associated with being a woman who is a racial minority. Tonight, I seek to explain how historically society sought to mistreat and represent all women, especially black women, and how currently black women are being erased entirely from the important spaces where their voices should be heard. I'll do this by starting with behavioral psychology theories that have been adopted by educators and parents and those who work closely with children to better explain what happens when society has moved black women's voices from the margins to off the page. For the purposes of our chat, let's look at psychologists' definition of learning. Learning is defined as a fairly permanent behavioral change due to some exposure to experiences or some sort of stimuli. Learning was first researched by psychologists like John B. Watson, whose work found that all behaviors are learned. So to summarize, all behaviors are learned reactions to a certain action. And from this broad definition, I want you to think, well, what are all the things she's going to talk about? If we're talking about all behaviors being learned, something has to happen to me in order for me to learn how to respond to it. And what are all the things we're going to cover? She only has an hour. Like, how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to touch on a little bit of everything. So. If psychologists believe, as they have for years, that learning is a behavior and that learning is dictated by some sort of change in behavior, then we must first look at the three types of learning. Okay? The first is classical conditioning. The second, operant conditioning. The third, observational learning. Classical conditioning, when an action creates a response or a reaction. Think about the dog here. Pavlov learned that with just a simple sound, a dog's mouth would salivate. The dog knew it's time to eat. Food, master's here, mommy's here, daddy's here, food. And the dog's mouth would salivate. The dog would never be given a command right, from a master, from a human. It was literally just a noise. Uh, you can compare this to how excited your, your pet may get when you come home and the garage door comes open and, and close. How excited your pet may get when, you know, the pet hears the keys at the door. It's the same thing. Just a quick noise alerts me to something else, and I have a response from that noise. Operant conditioning uh, is a response that is positively or negatively increased or decreased, and it reinforces behaviors. 
they use uh, the mouse here and <laughs> grab, grabbing the kibbles, but I like to use it whenever I consult and explain it as thinking about scolding. So for all of my parents out there, operant conditioning is when you're increasing or decreasing something in order to create a punishment or reinforcement of behaviors, and you've all done that, <laughs> right? You give and you take, and you give and you take, and you say, well, if you do it again, I'm gonna pull it back more. Okay, if you do what I've asked, I'll give you more of what you want, right? That's operant conditioning. If you operate in the ways that I expect you to, I will give you what you want, okay? See some of you nodding your heads. I'm doing a good job already. And lastly, observational learning. Observational learning is learning that occurs through the direct observation and then imitation of others. So it's not something I've heard, it's something that I get to see. It's something that I see in my parents, maybe a mentor, right? Um, the mother is at church, the teacher is at school. You have to remember, kids spend eight hours a day in school settings, right? It's the administrator who says a certain thing when I do a certain thing, right? I'm directly seeing it, and therefore it changes my behavior, okay? So take a second here, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning. This is where we begin to ask ourselves, what lessons has society taught black girls and women about their worth and their values, and how did we receive these lessons? Was it through classical conditioning? Was it through operant conditioning? Or maybe observational learning? Well, to answer this question, let's take a deep dive into a few real world examples. Let's see what each woman's life teaches others about her value. And at the end of these real world examples, at the end of this real world example, excuse me, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to talk to me. I'm a teacher by trade, so I can't sit up here and lecture all night behind this beautiful podium, it's gorgeous. But it is standing in my way between me and you and real conversation. So after this real world example, I would love to talk to you about what you think it teaches us about her worth and her value. And then you'll hear me ask you some pretty poignant questions about today and what it may mean for us today, okay? And then I have a few other examples I'd like for you to think through before I come back to my computer. Sarah Bartman. Sarah Bartman was born in, 19, in, sorry, in 1789 in South Africa's Eastern Cape. Her mother died when she was two years old. She was raised by her single father, and her father died not much longer after that. She was a teenager working as a maid when she was stolen from her homeland and put on display in what many would call a traveling exhibit, better known today as a circus or a carnival. Now, this is where some will say, but she signed a contract. She wasn't stolen, she signed a contract. With no access to an education to learn the King's English as we know it, she wouldn't have signed anything really, right? Um, she would have been without the knowledge to fully know what she was signing. She would have been without the knowledge to fully know where she was going. She would have been without the knowledge to fully know what a circus or a carnival exhibit, a freak show really was. A British doctor gave Sarah Bartman her stage name, the hot and tot Venus, and paraded her around so that very wealthy English men and women could look at her, watch her acts, and for the right amount of money, touch her, molest her, and even beat her. For years, this continued until Sarah Bartman became an older woman and the novelty wore off. I'm sure many women in the room will uh, agree. At a certain age, uh, the beauty, they tell you, oh, it, it'll wear off. You won't be so concerned about your physique. It'll, it'll all fade. Well, Sarah never really got the chance to enjoy her own physique or look at herself as different because to her, all of the women in Africa were shaped that way, right? Everyone had certain physiques. Everyone were a little heavier in this place or heavier in that place. Sarah didn't know about BMIs. She wasn't in the gym every morning. <laughs> she was happy with her physique. So she wasn't aware that it was an oddity until she was paraded as a circus act. For years, this continued. The molesting, the beating for the right price, the fondling, the torture, the poking and prodding through the cages, right? Like an animal. Uh, it continued until Sarah became an older woman, and then, of course, people stopped coming as regularly. She was regarded as a celebrity at this time, and in the streets of London, um, her celebrity came with a price. 
she was regarded uh, as a prostitute to many. She would be solicited on the streets just going to grab a bite to eat. She once agreed to be studied by doctors. They wanted to look at her physique, how her body grew in this way. How could she have uh, amassed this physique with no physical exercise, right, in the ways that they were defining physical exercise. They wanted to look at her genes. What makes you this way? She agreed under one condition. Because of the trauma that she had experienced for much of her uh, adolescence and young adulthood, she refused to allow the men in the room to see her naked or to touch her. They had to do their research from afar. Sarah Bartman died on December 29, 1815, but her remains, her brain, her skeleton, and her sexual organs remained in a Paris museum until 1974. Now remember, to those of you that said, well, I don't, I don't know if we teach black girls anything about themselves. I don't know if we teach black women anything about how we value them. And maybe you thought when I used Sarah Bartman as our first example for, for the night, well, she signed a contract. She's not, she's not an oddity. She's not unique. To die uh, in 1815 and to have your brain and your skeleton preserved is one thing. But to have your brain, your skeleton, and your sexual organs preserved is another. Sarah Bartman's remains, again, her brain, her skeleton, and sexual organs remained in a Paris museum until 1974. After this time, the remains were moved to a back room, but not discarded. They were still making money off of her body. Sarah Bartman remained in Paris and remained unburied until 2002. Now, I want you to think about the, the women you see on TV, the conversations we have with young girls about their bodies and how to dress and how not to dress. And I want you to just think about what a Sarah Bartman may have influenced today's black girls and women to think about their bodies. I want you to think about that before I give you my, my teacher speech around it. What do you think her life taught today's black girls and women about the value of their bodies and their physiques? That there's something to look at, but not in a positive way. That's right. I think that's a great way of looking at it. Anybody else? Something that you think her life would teach black girls or black women today? Something to look at, but not in a positive way? Yeah. A commodity of sorts. Remember, I told you she was regarded and revered as a celebrity, but I never told you she was a millionaire. I never told you that she profited off of her body. I told you that she was stolen from her land and others profited off of her. Does that make things a little bit clearer now, some of the things you see happening in popular culture? And you go, well, how could you ever wear that? How could you ever do that? Why would you think that that's cute? Why would you think that that's appropriate? Well, if what you've taught me is that my brain is attracted to some people, but my body will be revered, idolized by more people, then maybe I use my body to get where I want to go. Sarah Bartman taught, taught me that. I will be revered. Men and women will pay. I might be abused but I'll be a celebrity. So even though I truly believe that today's young uh, girls and women don't know all of the nuances of Sarah Bartman's life, they internally know these messages. They know, yes, my brain will take me far, but hmm, what about my physique? Hmm, how can I use that to go a little bit farther? It's commercialized. So the circus has turned into social media. We no longer pay and go into the Ford Center and watch. It's free now. But still a circus nonetheless. 
still have an audience. And the more I show, the more attention I get, the more you talk about me and you write letters to ban me from, uh, you know, the Lakers, uh, <laughs> the Lakers stadium. The more I show, the more you talk about me and I get to be on Dateline and I get to do interviews and maybe sell more records. And no, I might not ever be a millionaire, but guess what? I'm a celebrity. So when we talked a few moments ago about the over-sexualization of young girls, you have to remember that Sarah Bartman was a young woman when she was stolen from Africa. She was not an adult. I believe she started working as a maid for the, the two men that um, stole her and relocated her to Europe at like 14 years old. She was an orphan, no formal education, and they used what they could see to profit off of her. So this is why so many advocates for black girls and black women speak to um, trying to cancel out some of the over-sexualization that black girls speak of often. They will often tell you um, that they're told to do things um, that their white counterparts are never told to do. They're told to dress a certain way because you're now a woman. You look like a woman, right? You, you have the physique of a woman. You can't wear those things that your friends wear. You have to be more cognizant of what you're wearing because you don't want to be over-sexualized. And those, again, I don't think they know anything about Sarah Bartman, the young girls today, but I think they internalize those same themes. Claudette Colvin is another example. Claudette Colvin's name has been, for the most part, pushed out of the history books. Uh, she was the young lady who was first in terms of the uh, bus boycotts. Way before Rosa Parks did it, Claudette Colvin did it. But because of her age and maybe a little bit of socioeconomic status and the fact that she was an unwed teen mom, she was told that she could not be the face of the movement. Uh, another thing is that colorism sneaks in there with Claudette Colvin because Claudette Colvin um, is darker than, than I am. Rosa Parks, if you remember her physique and her aura, sort of her demeanor, is very fair skin, long hair. Claudette Colvin is um, uh, darker than I am, uh, short hair, and she always wore it in pin curls. Again, this is a teenager, right? She did it. Some scholars say months before Rosa Parks, but never got the recognition. Why is it that we don't speak Claudette Colvin's name? But we're so quick to tell children and, and our friends about Rosa Parks and how phenomenal she was and how strong she was, as she was. But what about Claudette Colvin? And what does it teach little black girls and women when we speak one name and not the other? What's different between them? I would argue colorism. I would argue ageism. I would argue the fact that Claudette Colvin was an unwed teenage mom. And I would argue that Claudette Colvin was not as well educated, formally educated as the beautiful, slender, fair skinned Rosa Parks. I have another example. Coretta Scott King. Now, many of you know her husband, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And the professor in me hates to forget the junior because I, I always want to say that's his dad. Um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Is, uh, was Coretta Scott King's um, beloved husband. However, how often do we speak his name and not hers? Was she not at home taking care of the home and the children? Was she not also receiving the death threats? I include Coretta Scott King as an example of what we teach black girls and women about companionship, and I think you'll see why in just a second. Because even after the reverend was assassinated, Coretta's relationship to him and to the movement and their mutual understanding of what their lives should be allowed her to travel around the country and still deliver his speeches long after he was buried. But we don't talk about that. We speak about him and what he did his work for workers, right? his work for the underprivileged, his work for black and brown people, his work for women of all races. 
but very rarely do we ever take the conversation past his assassination to what Coretta Scott King did to further his legacy, to petition to our, our country that he have a national holiday, to go and continue to read the speeches that he wrote months in advance of his assassination. It takes courage, but it teaches black girls and women that you're only as good as the man that you marry. And once he's gone, you're just a widow. Was she not also an activist? Did she not also risk her life on Edmunds Pettish Bridge? But we never talk about those things. We always talk about the Reverend and what he did and what Abernathy did and what Lewis did. We never include Coretta or their wives. That's another lecture. <laughs> Marsha P. Johnson. I would be remiss if I used an hour of your time tonight to talk about marginalized black women's voices if I did not include the voices of black trans women. Marsha P. Johnson um, was a, a gay rights activist in New York in the late 1960s. And her untimely death, which has never truly been solved, for many scholars sparked what we continue to see today in 2020, which is the killing of black trans women with the murderer going free day after day. Um, Marsha P. Johnson, uh, I would say, uh, was a trans activist, but also a gay liberator. She spoke widely about um, gay rights and gender identity far before we even knew what that phrase meant, right? Again, this is the late 60s, and the stole, Stonewall movements, excuse me, in New York City that really ushered in the gay rights movement um, was started uh, at a club that she was sitting in. They were just sitting in a club, and the police came in and said, you gay people can't all be mingling together. It's against the law. And they said, what are you talking about? It's the 60s. And they said, it's against the law. So as a black trans woman, she was beaten to a pulp. I'm sure her other trans friends were beaten as well. I'm sure there are pictures of them out there, but the pictures that keep me up at night are the pictures of her face and how she was treated and dragged. So she would recover from those bruises, right? No one was killed, thankfully, during the Stonewall riots in New York City in the late 60s. But those internal bruises stayed with her forever. And because no one was ever tried for that, right? Um, no one was ever questioned for the ways that they treated um, our LGBTQ brothers and sisters in that, that club that night, I believe, and many scholars would agree with me, that it began um, this weird trajectory in our country of doing terrible and unspeakable acts to gay and trans people and never having to account for it. 1969, New York City. Halsey is a pop star that many of you may not know, but uh, some of the younger people, uh, Hoosiers and uh, residents of Evansville would know. Halsey made lots of money off of her pop music and her physique and just being fun. Um, she's been very open and honest about her issues with um, some mental health issues, but also addiction and stress and anxiety. And most of her music talks about living life and being happy and being appreciative for life. So it's positive. However, she does have a few songs that are very honest and open about the things that she deals with as a young woman. A few years ago, Halsey sat down for an interview and she made a startling um, <laughs> comment. Some would say revelation, but those of us that knew, we knew. Halsey said in an interview, you know, I'm a black woman, so things hurt me. I feel things differently. When things are said, I question why people say them. Is it racism? Is it ageism? Is it sexism? And the interviewer looked at her and said, you're a what? She says, I'm a, I'm a black woman. I, I'm, ready, I'm ready to say it. Halsey's mother is white, Halsey's father is black, but she had spent her entire pop career hiding that side of herself. She would post pictures, you know, for the holidays and never really give a caption as to who this black man was hugging her. And then one day she decided, I'm tired of that. I, I wanna be who I am. Now, for the younger kids, uh, that might seem so new and modern, right? But I'm an old nerd. 
So I think of movies like Imitation of Life and how she was able to amass this celebrity right under our noses. And she's been a biracial woman who identifies as a black woman all this time. Interesting why she wouldn't want to tell us that she was black. What does she know? If I tell them I'm black, they will do. If I tell them I'm a black woman, they will treat. If I tell them I'm a black woman, they will marginalize. She never said it until a few years ago. That should make you wonder why. Why did she feel the need to hide her father? To hide a successful marriage, a successful um, and what many would call positive upbringing. Why? What does she know about our society and how we would have treated her? Hmm. Aretha Franklin. For most of Aretha Franklin's life, she grew up um, a PK, a preacher's kid. And she sang in churches around the country um, with her father and her family, and they would travel and sing praises unto God. And then she got the offer to do secular music, and she took it. Boy, did she take it. And a few years ago, Aretha Franklin did an interview, and they asked her, you know, you're the queen of soul. What things do you regret? What things would you go back and undo? And underneath her breath, she said, I would have been born lighter. With all the success, with all of the accolades, she wished that she was fairer. And when the reporter asked her to repeat herself, she changed the comment. And she said, oh, I was just kidding. Because if you know Aretha Franklin, you know that she's sort of known for that sense of humor. No, I was just kidding. What does she know about how far she could have gone if she were just a little fairer? She also went on a few years later to make a similar comment and said, I would have been skinny. Hmm. Now, I've seen pictures of Aretha Franklin when she was younger. To me, by no means was she overweight or obese, but I could see how, right, if you're looking at the fads and the trends of the time, the mini skirts and the bell-bottom jeans and the mules, how she could go, mm, if, I, if I were smaller, I could have gone farther, right? I could have done more. Hmm. Meghan Markle. What does Meghan Markle's life teach black girls and women today about how we value them and their voices? Meghan Markle was born to a black mother and a white father. She spent most of her childhood thinking about how she could be an activist and make change happen. Uh, she was actually on Nickelodeon around the time uh, I was growing up. Most 80 babies, uh, 80s babies probably don't remember that, but she was on Nickelodeon. Um, she did several um, uh, AIDS activist commercials on Nickelodeon when we were children. Um, and Nickelodeon at the time was very sort of uh, socially aware. It's not anymore. It was very socially aware and we would have uh, sit downs with the, the best sort of teen celebrities and we would talk about things from abstinence to AIDS and HIV awareness, right? Again, the 80s. And Meghan Markle was one of those kids, just by way of living in California, who was always there talking and sharing. And I think we should, and girls should. And why can't kids talk about how we feel? She's there. However, Meghan Markle did something terrible. She fell in love with a man. Dang it. And he just happened to have a royal lineage. And by way of his lineage, she was not welcomed. So Harry, because of how he grew up and what he saw and how paparazzi treated his mother, um, I think that he probably more so than Megan was afraid of what would happen to them if they were to have stayed. So a few weeks ago, he went on television in an eerily similar setup as to what his mother, Princess Diana, had done so many years ago. Just a close-up shot, a backdrop, and he didn't say this, but this is one of my uh, favorite quotes from one of my favorite movies. He said, I renounce my throne. <laughs> if you're going to make me choose between this woman and my family and my job and what I do and what I love, I'm going to pick the woman I love. And he had to make, a, for him, what I consider to be a life-changing decision to honor his wife and their son 
instead of his grandmother and his brother and his father and aunts and uncles. So he picked up, he made the announcement, he allowed his grandmother to draft the contract. He said, I'll pay you back whatever you want us to pay you back. I'll pay you back for living in that house. I'll pay you back for the renovations. I'll pay you back. I'll pay you back. We just want to be free. And they picked up and they moved to Canada. Now, during the time that they were still put, right, living this life of luxury and royalty, everyone said, is she crazy? She doesn't, she doesn't love it. She doesn't look happy. She, I would love it. I would be living the life of Riley. I would be shopping every day. In my mind, I, I think of like scenes of Pretty Woman. I would be shopping and I would be asking for shoes and hors d'oeuvres. I would get my hair done differently every week, right? But she wasn't happy. It, it didn't suit her. And I believe what we teach black girls and women just from looking at a portion of Meghan Markle's life, we'll truly probably never know what all happened in those few months of marriage while they were still there. I think what we teach black girls and women is that um, you're important for the sake of the picture. Come into the picture, take the picture with me. We look happy. We're inclusive. See, we allowed her in. She's cool, she's, a, she's one of the good ones. And then behind the scenes, don't question how we do things. Don't ask me to change how it's done. Don't ask me why others can't get a foot in the door. You got a foot in. Your foot is in. Be happy with that. And at the moment that you begin to forget your place, we will ask you to leave. Maybe not ask explicitly. Maybe we suggest implicitly. Maybe we nudge and say, you know, you don't have to stay here. Well, your son's of royal blood, so you can leave. He can stay. What does that teach black girls and women about their voices and their abilities to make sense of things that are going on around them and then to ask the people around them, hey, what do you think about this? Is this right? Is this how we do things here? Hmm. And then finally, Vanessa Nakati. Vanessa Nakati is a political activist from Uganda. And you might know her colleague, Greta. Um, she talks a lot about climate change. Um, she's been doing this for years, right? Um, she's maybe uh, 10 years oh. younger, 10 years or so younger than I am. And she travels the world urging us about the changes that we need to make today because she's seen the data. She's talked to uh, the statisticians, she's talked to the researchers and they're telling her what's going to happen, how this weather will continue to be unpredictable if we don't begin to make small changes today. So she gave up her life in Uganda and began traveling around the world to warn us. These are the little things that we can do. However, she doesn't get much publicity. Greta does. Vanessa is a dark skinned woman from Uganda and many of you may have heard that recently at a uh, climate change summit, there were uh, several political activists joining together to take a photo. Vanessa was on the end of the photo, and the other women in the middle were all white. They all do the same thing. She was the only non-white woman in that photo. And the Times photographer who took the photo to report out to us what was going on at this climate change event purposely cropped Vanessa out of the photo and publish that these young people are changing the way that we think about climate change. These young women are making the change. You should listen to these young women with this big picture of these four white climate activists. And then because I'm a nerd, I go, well, I, I follow Vanessa on social media. Wasn't she there? And before I could do my Google investigation, it came out that Vanessa was in the photo, that she had been cropped out intentionally. What does that teach young black girls and black women today about fighting for the things that they care about? You can fight for it alongside your white counterparts and your white allies, but at some point you will be pushed to the side and cropped out. You can fight for it enough to advance it, but at some point you won't be needed anymore. What does that teach her when she left everything she knew behind in Uganda to help warn us about what she, know, what she knows and what she believes is coming soon? 
Why should she continue to do anything for us? Those are the small ways and just those eight examples that we teach young black girls and black women how we value their voices, how we value their lives and their lived experiences. So from those eight examples, I know many of you are probably floored. Um, you're thinking through some of the misrepresentations that we've talked about and the mistreatments that we've discussed, but what if these lessons were happening weekly or daily in your lives instead of just here tonight in a matter of 40 minutes? What if these lessons were about you? What do these lessons teach you about how we value black women today? When I speak candidly with parents and grandparents, teachers and community leaders, they usually ask me about, quote, the odd emotions of the black girls in their classrooms or in their homes, in their lives, in their communities. They oftentimes mention the bowed head, the rounded shoulders, the lack of eye contact. They oftentimes mention the inability to provide you with a firm handshake. They oftentimes mention the need to sit in the back or the far side of any seated arrangement. They oftentimes mention the hesitation to speak up for oneself or others. And they oftentimes describe that despite the knowledge of a particular topic, no matter how accessible I make it, that the black girls or women in the room will refuse to speak up, refuse to acknowledge it, allow someone else to be the one to answer, to respond. In summation, there is an incessant need to blend in and never stand out. So they oftentimes ask me, so Xavier, that's a real thing. What is that? How do I fix this? To those questions, I usually reply, if you've always been told that your voice doesn't matter, that it holds no weight, and it rights no wrongs, you would choose to be voiceless too. That's right. This literal shrinking of oneself, this inability to make eye contact, this inability to speak up for myself even when I know that I'm right, this inability to provide a firm handshake, this inability to seat myself in the center or in the front of spaces that I, I inhabit, all stem from the microaggressions, the prejudices, and the biases hurled at these black young women and black women daily. It is their way of getting through and getting over. So I want to show you something. From their experiences, from their social roles and norms, from the classical and operant conditioning that we spoke about earlier, from observing people in the environment and how you treat Meghan Markle, how you treated Sarah Bartman, how you treated Aretha Franklin, how you treat, 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 how you treat it teaches them something. If the black girls and women in your life are utilizing these coping or defense mechanisms, you should ask yourself why you've never been considered an ally or a confidant. Why have they never felt comfortable enough with you, your identity and your presence in their lives as a teacher, an administrator, a colleague or a friend to share their emotions, their thoughts and their real lives with you? We must take the time in business, in education, in our day to day lives to consider what we can do to undo the lessons that society has taught and continue to teach our black girls and women. What have they learned from classical conditioning, from operant learning and observational learning, and how can we help to undo this? I believe that if we are intentional and honest with ourselves, that we will find ways that we can slow down this negative trajectory of learning for black girls and women and create not just inclusive spaces, but equitable spaces. Remember, inclusion means opening the door and providing access to the table. But equity means that we provide everyone with the same highly cushioned, reclining, state-of-the-art chair to be able to not just see the table, but speak across the table and enhance the dynamic of said table. So, without ever being told that they bring nothing to the table because of their gender, their gender identity, their race, their sexual orientation, their ability, their age, their social economic status, their religion or political ideology, what can we do to unteach 
black girls and women. If we want to end this erasing of black women, we must start here. We must start now. How can we provide inclusive spaces for young black women to fully become the young, for young black women to fully become the young black women of tomorrow? If they will be tomorrow's leaders, how do we help to enhance their today? I want you to take a second and consider all that we've discussed tonight, the different behavioral learning styles and how we as a city can help to make sure that E is truly for everyone. Thank you.